I'm down here hunting some monster whitetails in Kentucky. Uh, we're with the HuntWise crew. They invited me down here. It's kind of a work trip, fun trip, and I'm not complaining. We're hunting whitetails, and this is awesome. We're at Salt River Outfitters, and uh, George, the, the head guide, and, and his crew is incredible. It's been a lot of fun, and I'm not used to going to guides. It's the second time ever, so this is a great experience. It's actually kind of exciting, um, and it's really important because when I came down here, of course, like you guys out there, if you're, if you're packing, and you're going on a whitetail trip, especially when you're bow hunting, there's a lot of gear that you need to bring. Um, it's almost like I relax when it's gun season because I'm just throwing my gun, even muzzleloader, just putting the pieces together. I'm going out. Bow, to me, takes a little bit more planning, a little bit more thought. And uh, we had a lot of gear to pack. And I'm gonna go over what I feel are about my top 10, 12, I'm not even sure what it is, uh, pieces of bow hunting gear that have been very important to me uh, throughout my career of bow hunting going back to 1985 actually a long long ways back um, i don't know if this is my 36th season 35th somewhere around there going back to the days of the old darton 30mx if anyone knows about that um, that was the cheapest one that you could get for bow hunting and that's my brother and i started with over the years there's been some really essential gear gear that i need and and thankfully we've so much incredible gear going forward um, and i wanted to start out with something that i've talked a lot about before and it's kind of crazy because I'm down here in Kentucky. There's some warmer winds, warmer uh, weather. People, what are you bringing a hand warmer tube for? And this is a hand warmer tube. I've, I've said before, the first one I had of these was when I was a teenager. I was probably 15 or 16. Wanted to keep my hands warm. This is after a sit on a stand where my fingers were numb. I can still remember standing on a branch in a small oak tree where we used to hunt near Clarkston, Michigan. My brother and I, my dad would drop us off and uh, we'd go hunt. And um, my fingers froze, just literally, they were numb. It seemed like they were numb even when I got back 20 minutes later to home. So we've come a long way since then. My mom, I saw one of these at Dunham Sporting Goods in Waterford off Dixie Highway. And I really wanted to get one and it just, it was too much money. And, you know, I was at that time mowing lawns and, uh, and shoveling snow for my income and it was just too much money for me to spend. So my mom took some pieces of wool she fabricated them together, put a big safety pin on it, and that was my first hand warmer. And uh, so recently, the hand warmer that I have right now, um, this is actually, I wanted a pretty good hand warmer. Um, at the time, I found a cheap one um, that's on the inside of this. And these are the Brambler Gators from First Light. They're actually waterproof. I started using Gators for hand warmer tubes about 25 years ago. And uh, they make a great outer layer of this this uh, incredibly waterproof layer and then it's insulated on the inside. What's pretty cool is there's a zipper here and all you need to do is we got some Velcro, but we just take this apart, this Velcro. We put the Velcro on the inside so it doesn't stick together and then we can actually access that zipper on the inside. So that's step two with this fabrication of this makeshift first light uh, hand warmer tube, but we're really enjoying it so far. The big thing with this, is this carries my Flashlight carries my um, my cell phone. Also carries my grunt tube, and a grunt tube is a really essential piece. But what I've used this for it doesn't matter if it's warm weather or cold weather. Of course, it keeps the elements out of my hands, keeps my hands warm forever. I put a couple big heat packs in here when it's cold, but especially with the waterproof layer, it uh, keeps the elements away from my hands. And then I also carry my face mask in here. I carry my gloves in here. So a lot of pieces of essential gear fit right in here and they're right here, right in front of me. A lot of times when I'm waiting for a shot, I have my bow on my leg and I keep my arm resting on this and, uh, and it's right there ready to put on the, uh, on the string, on that string loop and make it go. So this is very essential, kind of an odd piece right here, but critical. Of course, my face mask is always on and uh, with me. Most important call ever, I think. Um, we live, we hunt in a lot of high pressure states. So when we're up in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, over into Pennsylvania, um, the last thing I want to do in some of those high pressure states, you know, Michigan had over 400,000 bow hunters at one time, Wisconsin, 375, 350,000, even down in Illinois, 250,000. So we have a lot of people using uh, calls, then they really get shy of say a snort wheeze call or a growl or especially rattling antlers. I had someone near me two years ago using all three and they were about 300 yards away. I had a pile of deer in front of me that would look their way, run away, 
come back because they want to hit a food source where you're watching. And it was really important that this person over there and what we found out that, boy, you can't get away with a lot of calls. That, that guy was spooking deer within 300 yards. He was using the snort wheeze, growl, rattling antlers and everything else he could throw. I imagine he saw a big buck across the fields and it wasn't working. But uh, bottom line is this grunt call, it's very low impact. It's my favorite call that you can use for deer. It's always in this hand warmer tube right here and very important. Laser rangefinder. These are in no particular order, but this is critical right here. I love getting into the stand. I mean, it's something you don't use that much at all. You're sitting there, you're sh shooting a few targets, 20, 30, 40 yards. That little pocket in the weeds is 30 yards over there and, uh, and very important. So always have my range finder with me. And this is going back to a long time. My, my friend, Tim Glover, good friend, Tim Glover, uh, back in the early 2000s hunting Wisconsin, um, he had a hard time in a stand, a particular stand. I think he might've missed a buck. And um, sorry, Tim, if that's not true, but I was thinking that's what it was. And it was hard for him to range. He was having a difficult time. You know, back in the day, we were pacing off from a fence row and putting out a rock or a stick um, at 20, 30 yards. He didn't have a range finder. I had a spare. And from that point on, I always had a spare with me because if I had friends bow hunting with me, I didn't want him to go in the woods without a, without a range finder. Very critical. Binoculars. I've owned a lot of binoculars going back into the 3D days. And, uh, and wanting to see exactly where the rings were, the 10 ring or the 20 ring or the uh, 12, 12 ring, um, the center X or the whole 10, whatever it might be. I wanted to see those lines so I knew where to aim, uh, aim off someone else's arrow or whatever it might be. So I quickly learned back in the 90s how valuable high quality optics are. These are the Vortex UHDs, very high quality. And high quality binoculars you, you get what you pay for in life most of the time but in binoculars it is so critical the difference between a 1200 1500 pair of binoculars and a 400 dollar pair is stark and contrast you just have to look through them in low light to tell that now that being said not anyone can afford to spend that much money for quality glass and i understand that but these are something quality binoculars you'll have for the rest of your life i made the mistake of saving up and buying a 400 dollar pair of binoculars then another $400 pair of binoculars, and then another $400 pair of binoculars. I should have just started with something high quality to begin with, and it would have saved me a lot of money down the road because I still had those $400 pair, and then I bought a nicer pair. So um, look to buy a good pair, and the difference is, is it's still shooting light, it's that last 15 minutes of light, and it's so critical that you can actually see, you might be able to see the body very well, you might even be able to see it's a really nice buck. You're not just not sure if it's the buck that you're after. I've had times where quality binoculars, deer's walking by, I can't see with my eyes. And even just for identification of knowing what's walking by, because you always think it's this giant buck walking by at dark and it's a, a little button buck. And uh, I could actually see the buttons with the binoculars, couldn't even see the deer without them. So critical to me, something quality, even if you have to save for a few years and then buy something that's gonna last an entire lifetime and especially from a company that has a lifetime warranty. Bow holder over the years. Back in the day, it was cutting a branch. Again, being cheap, staying, uh, making sure we weren't spending a lot of money. It was trying to find a tree with a branch where we could stick it. And that's where for years I've actually used a lot of mesh steel platforms on my my tree stands we have them on the family traditions but i'll set the bow right on the tree stand let it lean back into me and I've, i had it once fall out of a stand in 1996 that was the last time it actually fell or even came close to falling out of a tree that one fell like 30 feet and bent my sight and uh and i learned quickly that something like this that i could put in wherever i wanted and put that up and hang it above me then uh, very critical. So this is an important piece that we have in all our stands in Minnesota, Wisconsin, anywhere we hunt, and he went out on public land. And guess what? It fits really well inside this, uh, this hand warmer tube. So another use for the hand warmer tube. Getting to safety, I didn't start with safety because it's kind of boring, but at the same time, so critical. Um, the uh, safety harness, safety vest, whatever you call it, is, uh, is so important. And then we've used the safety line. So this in combination with the safety line. Unfortunately, I didn't start using these till about six or seven years ago when my kids started hunting and then Diane. And I should have been using them all along. I always used, uh, you get up there, you, you strap in. I used a vest for a long time. Back in the day, I used the very dangerous strap that run around your waist that could suffocate you if you fell over and you couldn't get out of the, that, uh, that position. 
but uh, so critical to even just strap in and you're incredibly safe before you ever even step foot off the ground. It made me feel so good about my kids going out and, and certainly Diane. And at the same time, it made them get into stands that they might not have otherwise climbed into. It's 20 feet up. They didn't want to get into that location. You know, those open trees that feel like you're, and you're on the edge of a ridge. It feels like you're climbing up and 50 feet high. They climbed with a lot of confidence up into the tree. And, um, and so confidence, getting them into stands that they otherwise probably wouldn't have, uh, so critical and being safe. How many times, and if you're a new hunter, we have a lot of people that have been hunting for many decades, and then we have a lot of new hunters on here. I, I hear comments all the time, and I really appreciate you. Um, but how many times you've got to a stand, it's cold out, you wore a stocking cap in, and you forget your brim and you're facing to the east southeast in the morning and that sun's coming up and it can happen in the evening what a pain i've even taken my stocking cap pulled it more down towards the front and rolled it up so i had this little teeny visor sticking out so that i had some type of visor and so you'll always see with visor i love just even if it's just a regular hat putting a stocking cap over uh, first light makes a really nice insulated hat with a little brim on it um, but always remember to bring especially to your new bow hunters this right here my buddy colin back in wisconsin he had a, um, a mishap with a buck a few years ago that was a really nice buck and i can't remember if he took the shot or not but he was looking right into the sun and it was the moment of truth the buck he's after some nice five six year old buck and he didn't have that brim on his on his hat and uh, he was kicking himself for ever doing that and you know we all make mistakes he's been hunting for decades and and i do too so try not to try to learn from my mistakes in doing that uh, flashlight seems rather obvious but i want to talk about the type of a flashlight last year on the way in while i was going in for gun season about 600 yards away across the hollow, down 300 feet in elevation, across a couple homes on the other side. Someone was looking for their, their place to sit their chair on opening day, opening morning. And I know they were because they were wearing a headlamp and it looked like a spotlight going around the woods. Deer were between them and myself going in, blowing, blowing, blowing. They weren't blowing at me, they were blowing at him. And uh, it was pretty crazy how far he pushed deer away and didn't even know it. I'm not kidding, you could have landed a, a plane by that light. And that's, that's a thought. If you can land a plane by your light that you're using for bow hunting, it's too bright. I like actually some of the high-tech flashlights that, there's one I've used, it's an Olight flashlight, but it has a half a lumens beam. It goes all the way up to a thousand lumens and it goes lumens and it goes all the way down to a half. They call it a moonlight. It barely, you can barely see it. If you just shine a bright light, like from your truck or your, your cell phone looking at it, and then you go to walk in the woods, you can't even see it. It's that dim, but it's perfect for walking in and out. We learned this back in the 90s the hard way. We're walking across the farm field. We spooked deer 600 yards away, 300 yards away across the field because we just turned the flashlight on and they start spooking a long way away. They know what that light means. It's kind of nice when we're walking in thick cover where we can get in and out of a stand and not spook deer because we can have a bright light and that light's not getting out because we have heavy thick conifer or down in a ravine where that light's just not getting out. But dimmer is better. And think about, you know, I have used the colors of green and red for flashlights, but I think of all those deer that are staring at trail cameras with the red infrared bulbs that are flashing and on for video and running away and never coming back to that location. If you can't think if you think they can't see red, think about those trail cameras that spook deer every single year in the dark with the red infrared. That's why I always recommend the blackout too. I think we're getting about done to our list here. Um, you know, these are what I use. These are some essentials. You know, of course you have a sun elimination spray. Um, I always like shooting my target if we're on a trip. Um, I always like shooting my bow before we go out, out in the evening. Uh, it's a good time for practice. And at, like we're here in a camp, we have some fun people to shoot with. And uh, Chris, hey, come here. Can you be in a video for a second? Please? Are you gonna charge me the same? Yep. He charges way too much, but- bucks uh, every 15 minutes. Ah, dang it, but we don't, <laughs> but, but I don't pay unless we hit 15 minutes, right? Right, right, right. Well, this is Chris B from Chris B Archery and um, kind of fun in camp when we can all sit here and shoot at some animals before we go out, fine tune mm -hmm. the bows. Your bow is fine tuned like for months in advance, year round, everything, mm -hmm. and most of our should be. But Chris is in camp. Um, we have a good crew here with the Hunt Wise crew. Allie's down here too. Dylan's filming. 
So we're having a lot of fun and uh, part of it shooting. And Chris and I are gonna do a little shooting video right here. Chris is constantly uh, teaching me how to shoot, which is awesome. Whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but we're having fun. And outside of all this gear that you can bring and uh, making sure you practice your bow, especially before you're out, even just taking five shots before you head out to the woods. It's not even necessarily that practice sometimes, it's just that confidence yeah, uh, of confidence shooting. Confidence is huge, especially for me. I noticed, uh, well, we're gonna talk about long range shooting, but Diane shot her deer a week ago Monday with the first time with a vertical bow. And um, it first block everything. It was first deer with a vertical bow, everything. So it was a pretty cool experience, but she had, for the previous two to three weeks, she started shooting at 30 yards a lot. And the shot ended up being 26, 27 yards, and it gave her a huge amount of confidence to where she was shooting at 30 all the time and really honing it in. And so when that deer was at 26 yards, um, she made a great shot, double lung, and, and that gave her a lot of confidence. Chris, put you on the spot. Can you think of any other essential gear um, when you're bow hunting, getting out in the woods? Um, you think wind, anything? Wind checker? Wind checker? Oh, that is a really, really used, good one. I was just, I mean, wind, I was wind checker. Thinking, and it's like wind checker. I always hear the little, little milkweed things or just something like you know you check your wind beforehand but it's always good throughout the night as it's so, it's so important yeah. i can't believe i didn't think of that one dylan we went over this list <laughs> now dylan's been he's had the milkweed um yeah, lately that's what I, I do um both. i do and i've told this story before i'm not going to demonstrate but i blow bubbles and so i blow that bubble and it floats out of the stand yeah, really? i'm not kidding <laughs> I tried to turn away from Dylan, so I'm not That's sticking cool. my tongue out at him. But um, anyways, I can blow bubbles. And we learned to do this. Um, I think my mom knows this. But uh, we were up in the balcony at church as teenagers, and we thought it'd be cool to blow bubbles off the balcony. And then while they're singing with their hymns open, this bubble would land on the hymn. And uh, we thought it was really funny. You know, as a 15-year-old, 14-year-old teenager, it was pretty cool. Until the pastor said, with the boys in the balcony that are spitting below, return to your seats or your parents. So we dove under the pews at that time. And we snuck out the back. And then some of the ushers at the time that were some really good people for influencing good ways uh, to go on our paths. But I can remember them grabbing our ear, taking, them, taking us to the pew where our parents are. We tried to hide our heads and in shame. And that's how we learned. <laughs> hey, sorry to interrupt this video, but... My web class series is finally begun. How to design your whitetail property is on my website and there's a link in the description. Please check it out. Before we wrap this up, I have one more piece of essential gear that as a diabetic, I think it's important uh, to actually be able to indulge every once in a while. So I guess Diane will find out about this. She would wonder why I bought the 100 piece well, I would say I didn't buy the 240 bag piece. So that was a good thing. Plus they're little, so you can just have a little bit at a time. But Camp Life, you need some that candy. Is, they are good for morale. Yeah, this is good for morale. You, you want, yeah, want some right there? I haven't seen, you haven't seen any deer all morning. You take this out and eat it. Yeah. It and feel a little better. And you always remember the more pieces you buy, the more, per, the less per piece you pay. So even if you don't plan on eating them all and you drop some on I the know. ground, it's cheaper that way too. So that's, that's a really, it was, it wasn't even five seconds. So anyways, don't forget the candy and snacks. And uh, if you're worried about making them, making noise, pre unwrap them, put them in a Ziploc bag, a lot quieter. I've actually gone through the pain to do that and uh, it's worth it in the stand.